Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Okay, uh, good morning. Happy Sabbath to every single one of you. And of course, before we begin our, our study this morning, I'm going to invite you, if you can, to please kneel with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Jehovah, we, we thank you for lending us another Sabbath day. And Father, now as we open your word to see what you have for us today, I pray that our ears may be open to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Please help us to be attentive, help us to comprehend, and help us to act out the instruction that we will be receiving. We thank you and we ask you these things in Jesus' name, your Son. Amen. Well, as you can see from the screen here, I've titled my talk or presentation, The Day of Jehovah Approaches. Now, in the King James Version, we read, The Day of the Lord. And oftentimes, when we hear that term, the day of the Lord, what do we think about? The Sabbath, right? Or perhaps the day that Jesus comes for, for the second time, correct? But in this study or in this presentation, we're going to get a new viewpoint, perhaps for many of you, of the Lord's day, or as I titled it, the day of Jehovah. Nevertheless, the Sabbath, during this period of time titled the Day of Jehovah, plays a significant role. Okay? just want you to keep that in mind. The Sabbath plays a significant role. So we take our, our scripture here. Blow ye the trumpet where? In Zion. And sound an alarm where? In my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Jehovah cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So we are commanded, according to this scripture, according to this verse, to blow the trumpet in Zion. A Zion is a symbol or a representation of who or what? God's people, correct? So we are to blow this trumpet in Zion, or among God's people, and to sound an alarm again in my holy mountain. Why? Because Jehovah's day draws near. That's why. And we're going to see there's prophetic waymarks that tells us how near we are to this day. Oftentimes, I've known, well, my kids are getting better. I noticed when we went to Arizona. But when they were younger, and we drove a couple of hours, two or three hours, are we are almost there? <laughs> are we almost there? there and, and sometimes we get a little impatient because we know the distance. But I'm encouraged when I read a sign, 15 miles, 20 miles, it tells me I'm getting closer to my destination. And so there's prophetic way marks that tells us or point to us how near we are to this very day. And it keeps reading, a day of darkness and gloominess. Gloominess there is a day of uh, sadness. A fear, a day of clouds and thick darkness, 
as a dawn spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There had not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after them, even to the years of many generations. So this day is said to be a day of darkness, gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, and a great and strong people are described. Who are these people? That's a good question. And we're going to find out by the end of our, our presentation, we will know who these people are who are tied with the day of Jehovah. This is one reason why we are to recognize the sound of the trumpet. If we fail to recognize the sound, our life can be imperiled. How can we prepare for battle if we fail to recognize its sound? How can we recognize the sound? Well, if we recall, Jesus told his disciples, my sheep do what? Hear my voice. They know me, correct? And I know them, and they follow me. So in order for us to recognize that trumpet sound, we must become familiar with it. Why? That's another question. There's many trumpets sounding in the world today and in Zion. Many trumpets, many messages, and we must recognize the correct one. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own heart. A particular translation reads, who fabricate their own prophecies reads a particular translation. Hear ye the word of Jehovah. Thus said the Lord Jehovah, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. They follow what? Their own spirit. We are counseled when we don't, when we have questions about Bible interpretation. We, we, we have what something that we call the spirit of what? Prophecy. We shouldn't go following after our own spirit when we have plenty of divine counsel. The Bible keeps reading, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither built up the wall for the house of Israel, to stand in the battle in the day of Jehovah. See, th this is what's going on. This is what's happening. They're causing the people not to prepare for the day of battle. These false teachers. They have seen falsehood and lying divination that say, Jehovah saith, but Jehovah had not sent them. And they have made men to hope that the word would be confirmed. Have ye not seen a false vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination, in that ye say, Jehovah saith, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, because ye have spoken falsehood and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am what? Against you, said the Lord Jehovah. That's pretty serious. I learned something. Now, there was a point in time, I will admit, that I was teaching falsehoods. But when we study and we become acquainted with the truth, we must throw those concepts into the trash bin. We must be humbled to accept correction. However, there are some who think they know better. I, for one, I don't think that way. 
I don't consider myself smart enough to figure things out. And I praise God that I can read so that I can just read and take as I read. And I hope that's your desire as well. We keep reading. And my hand shall be against the prophets that see false visions and that divine lies. They shall not be in the council or the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord Jehovah. Has, has God changed? Is his character still the same? Are his viewpoints still the same? Yes. Yes, they are. So if we're teaching falsehoods today. There's a warning. There's a reproof. And I pray that we can accept that reproof. Otherwise, we're going to be left out. If we want to be successful students of the prophecies, we are told, what book should we study? Daniel and the Revelation. Where we are told that the path is laid out so plainly that there is no need to err therein. That's pretty clear to me. There is no need to err. There is no need to commit mistakes, we are told, by God's messenger. The question is, will I believe it? Will you? And here's a statement here. Those who will diligently study this book will have no relish for cheap sentiments presented by those who have a burning desire to get out something new and strange to present to the flock of God. The rebuke of God is upon all such teachers. Do we want God's rebuke upon us? I sure don't. I sure don't. For the day of Jehovah holds shall be on every proud and lofty one, and on every lifted up one, and he shall be brought low. It takes humility to say, you know what? I was wrong. And if you have publicly taught differently, I know I asked a few people for forgiveness. Say, I'm sorry for what I taught you. I taught you wrong. How for the day of Jehovah is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. What does how mean? Does anyone know? cry, right? Whoa! I remember a brother years ago. This is, I maybe I was three years into the truth. The Adventist church. Um, and I remember him saying, of course in Spanish, he said, many of us desire for the day of God to come. But the Bible says that we should not. Notice here, behold, the day of Jehovah comes cruel and with what? Wrath and fierce anger to lay the land waste and he shall destroy its sinners out of it. So how will this day come? How is it described here? A day that is cruel and with wrath and fierce what? And how many of us desire that day? Well, remember John's words? Even so, come who? Lord Jesus. And that'll be the climax of that day. And as a matter of fact, it was mentioned during Sabbath school um, when, when Christ comes after the 1,000 years. I believe that there this comes to a conclusion.
Woe to those desiring the day of Jehovah. What is this for you? The question is asked. The day of Jehovah is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a snake bit him. Shall not the day of Jehovah be darkness and not light? Even every dark and no brightness in it. In other words, there's no escape. Right? You roam from the lion, and who's waiting for you? A bear. And then you lean, you go in a house for safety, and there a serpent bites you. There's no escape. And we are told that the wicked during that time will cry out to the rocks to do what? To fall on them. They'll be running towards death. They'll wish that they can die. So, so for what purpose? Hide us. From who? From the Lamb. And you imagine that. Hide us from the Lamb. Now is the time to seek Him. To seek Him and His Father. Because the day comes when many will seek and will not find. And for this, I believe that it is important that we have not just any faith, but the faith of who? Jesus. How important then is that we possess his mind, his spirit. Amen. Just yesterday, as we were sharing um, during a Zoom study, we mentioned, well, we mentioned a few things, but the, the core, the purpose, or not the purpose, but what we dwelt on was the, important, uh, the importance of this fact. We are not allowed, or we should not allow, for our human emotions to have control over us. In other words, we should have perfect peace in the midst of a storm. We have no clue whatsoever. We can imagine all we want, but no pen, we are told, can describe what this is going to bring and what this is going to be like. And in order for us to be in perfect peace, we indeed must have the mind of Christ. Otherwise, we're going to give ourselves over to fear or whatever it may be. We're going to abandon ourselves to these negative emotions. And guess what? We will not be under the control of God's spirit. But whose spirit? Satan. The battle is for the mind. And whose words are we going to grasp and embrace and hold on to? King David wrote, your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And that is to be our experience, not even in thought, we are to sin. Notice, and the word of Jehovah came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, so says the Lord Jehovah, how woe is the day. For the day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of who? The nations. And the sword shall come on Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundation shall be broken down. This day, we are told, is the day of the nations. We're going to read a little bit more on that. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Well ye, alas, for the day, for the day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near. It shall be a day of clouds, a time of what? Of the nations. And that day is approaching. That day is fast approaching, and we're going to see that. 
Notice, for the day of Jehovah is near upon all the nations, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee, thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. So again, God is telling us that this day is the day, a set time for who? For the nations. For the nations. For that day is a day of the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour and be satiate, and shall drink its fill of their blood. For the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, hath a sacrifice. Where? Where does it say? In the north country, by the river Euphrates. Does that ring a bell? Where else do we read about the river Euphrates? And they, and they had breastplates, as it were blessed breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Lose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And I thus I saw the horses in vision, what did he saw in vision? Horses in vision. And them that sat on them, on, sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three plagues was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouth. By this particular people, which we understand to be the Mohammedans or Islam, how many are said to have been killed? The third part of men. But they touched, they touched not one class. And we read in Revelation, I believe it's the same chapter 9. It was those who have the seal of God who they did not touch. How important it is that we have God's seal placed upon our foreheads. The seal is a protection. We are protected. We have Jehovah's approval and his name is written upon our forehead. And we are told that nothing shall come near our dwelling. That's a promise. Where else do we read of horsemen in connection with Islam? Well, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And at that time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with what? Horsemen. And with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And we know the, the history behind this text, that the war that took place in 1798. So again, this power is described with warriors, horsemen, on horses. And in the past, I've shared with you some images, correct? of the woes, how they were represented in these charts, in our pioneer charts, drawn uh, on these um, cloths with horsemen ready for battle. The prophet Joel penned, a, foul, a fire, I'm sorry, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth, the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. Here's something interesting. Where was the Garden of Eden at? Does anyone know? Where was it located? Was it near Turkey? Was it? Iran, around that area? Check your phone. Not too far. Well, it says here, the land is as the Garden of Eden before what? Before them. That's interesting. 
I find it interesting. And behind them, behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and none hath escaped them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so do they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains do they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people sit in battle array. They run like mighty men, they climb the wall like men of war, and they march every one in his ways, and they break not their ranks, and Jehovah uttereth his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for, his strong, for he is strong that executed his word, for the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? So what have we grasped thus far? What I'm trying to show you, or the Bible's trying to tell us, is that Jehovah's day is near. One. It's a day or a time set for the nations. And it's giving us a description of this um, sacrifice that is going to be taking place in, the, in the, what we read in the north by the river Euphrates. And we turn to Revelation and the river Euphrates is connected with a people. They symbolize a people. And these people are the Mohammedans or Islam. And it gives us more description. And one of them was men on horses. Correct? So these people are tied with the day of Jehovah. Now, here's, I want to share this. I don't have the scriptures for it because we will be here a lot longer. And I'm not trying to keep you here long. I'm trying to make it short and to the point. The Bible is stating that it is before his army. Now, are, are we saying that the Mohammedans are God's army? Has he ever called the Babylonians his army? Has he? Has he ever chosen nations that don't recognize him as a true God, as his right hand to execute judgment? Yes. Could it be that he's using these people to bring judgment upon the land? Yes. He's the same today as he was in the past. And the descriptions that we have read point to, this other, to these people. There's no other that fit, fit these descriptions. I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Let the nations, verse 12 reads, bestir themselves or awake, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the nations round about. Where are they being called? To the valley of who? Of what? Of what? To the valley of Jehoshaphat. And where is this valley at? Does anyone know? Right in the outskirts of Jerusalem, in Israel. There's another part in the Bible, we're going to read it, where this battle or this war is given what title? Armageddon. And Armageddon takes place under the sixth plague. Revelation 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. I was taught to believe 
that this preparation for the kings of the east were nonetheless Jesus and his host. But I never questioned. I never questioned that. Perhaps someone else that's more keen and sees things a little bit more carefully might have said, well, if that's Jesus, why is kings in a lower K? But the reason why is because there's a new interpretation. There's a new message, a new tune to the trumpet. And that's why our people are asleep. But nevertheless, this scripture points to the kings of the east or the nations. And you'll see right now, the verse read, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the beast and of the, I'm sorry, of the mouth of the dragon and of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, prophet for what purpose? For what purpose are these spirits that come out of these powers? For what reason? Notice. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. What is the purpose? For what reason? To call them to what? To battle. For war. That's the reason why these unclean spirits come out. I'm going to share a quote here. This is taken from the story of the seer of Patmos. Notice what, what, I, what I'm going to read. But when the sixth plague is poured out, there is no restraining hand. The Turkish power, designated as the river Euphrates, which has separated between the east and the west, gives way. And like the rushing together, of mighty storm clouds, the armies of the earth, striving for the territory, meet in the valley of Jehoshaphat. The ancient meeting place for Egypt and Assyria, known in the Hebrew as Megiddo, and in Greek as Armageddon. That's why among Christians we refer it to as Armageddon, right? The word itself means the place of the troops. And the history of battles fought there typifies the last great contest between the nations under the sixth plague. In the days of Deborah, the prophetess, the armies of Israel fought against Jabin, and the king of the Canaanites were captain. It was Sisera. God wrought for Israel, and the victory called forth the song of Deborah and Barak. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan, in Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. In the valley of Megiddo, Josiah, king of Israel, was slain by Pharaoh Neko, or Neku, who was passing by the valley of the stronghold of the Abyssinians of the, on the Euphrates. The death of the Jewish king caused great lamentation called the morning of Hadadrim, Hadadrim. And looking forward to the time of the end, the prophet Zechariah says, in that day they shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. Now notice he's, he's quoting this, and he's saying that looking to the days right at the end. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of had, Hadadri, I can't pronounce that name, is Had, Hadadrimen in the valley of Megiddo. While the nations are gathering for, their, for, their, for this great contest, the seventh angel pours out his vial in the air. The elements which had heretofore mingled, giving life to man, clash together, and above the tumult, the mighty peals of thunder and the flashy flashes of lightning, the voice of Jehovah himself is heard saying, It is done. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, 
and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth from the vine, and as falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in, he bathed in heaven, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And there's a lot more information. You should read this book as well. So again, this points, this what we just read points, it's pointing to us the great war that's going to take place there. Is it a third world war? We can call it that, but the Bible calls it Armageddon. And I, from what I see, this is in the horizon. Do you believe that? The nations, they're eager for war. They're eager for war. This should tell us how close we are to the finish line, to the close of human probation. And for this reason, for this reason, because God sees these things and he has revealed these things to his servants, the prophets. He tells us, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Gather my people and get them ready. There's many people putting together conventions and assemblies. But there's a purpose in Joel. And the purpose is because the day of Jehovah approaches. And he gives us insight of what this carries. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Are these Bible declar declarations on the day of Jehovah true? That our pioneers understood these Bible passages correctly because to the masses in Zion or in Adventism don't believe so. Is there any evidence outside the Bible and our pioneer literature that this is so? At the, that we see events leading towards this. Is Islam getting ready for war? Are they calling for a caliphate? Is Turkey involved? I want to share with you the following clip. And I hope that you're able... He's, he's speaking English, but he's pretty quick. And there's subtitles underneath, so you might want to read along. But... I hope that you can, you know, stay with the pace of, of the clip. But notice what is being said here. This was June 14 or the 19th of this year. So it was just last month. Notice their viewpoint, how they understand this. I want to, to ask you one question. What's the distance between Cape Town and Al-Quds? Why I ask this question? Because in the future, you will be the army for the Muslims to protect Al-Quds and Al-Mazlaq. This the important issue in the world. Also, second question. If we are want to talk about Bani Israel, Anbiya Bani Israel, Yahud, and the story with Muhammad Wasallam, the story with prophets, the story with other prophets, how many ayah in Quran? It's talking about that. 835 ayah. One over seven from Quran is talking about 
Bani Israel and Yahud and Barakat al-Quds. It's one from seven. This is American. Now, where is Yahud in these three talks? There is no Yahud. Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, Al-Masjid al-Haram, and Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. This is the first building in the world. These two. There is no Yahud in that time. All of you will visit Al-Quds. All the people, Muslims, Kafirs, from Cape Town, from Johannesburg, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from all the world, from Adam up to the last, all of them, they will go to Al-Quds. Because it's Ardul Ahshir Mahshar Wal Manshar. Battles between us and Yahud, where, where will it be? Where it will be? In the last time, Al Yahud, they said, this is ma uh, battles Majiddo. And the Christian, they said, Har uh, Majiddon. And Muslims, what they said, Al Malahim Al Kubra. Al Malahim Al Kubra in the last, between us and Yahud and Christian, it will be there. Also, second thing. Al-Dajjal, ayna yuqtal? Al-Dajjal, where is he kill? Uh, Nabiullah Isa alayhi salam, he's come in Dimashk, Damascus, and he's follow the Dajjal. He's in the gate of Babi Lud, at the Dajjal in Palestine. Ya'juj wa Ma'juj in Palestine. Isa alayhi salam in Palestine. Al-Yahud in the future, and Christian in Palestine. All the th all your future is connecting in this land. Asal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yansura deenahu wa yu'li kalimatahu wa an yuharrir al masjid al aqsa al mubarak wa an yarzuqana jami'an al salat fil masjid al aqsa al mubarak muharririna insha'Allah. Pretty interesting, right? I'm going to try to pronounce that name. Allah Aqs Mask. Do you know that? You know what that's referring to? The temple rock or the or the dome there in Jerusalem. The devil does the devil know all these things? You better believe he does. And you better believe that he's more familiar with prophecy than we are. And that's one of the reasons why he has inspired men to to change our old views. And that is why he inspired men to pen or write books of a new order. And so our eyes are blind. And we don't see what we ought to see. But I praise God for people who stand for the old truths. For the, for the, the original faith. Praise God. And we need to support them. And not only support them, but embrace these truths and share them and get ready because it's coming. Here's a quote by Alan White. Satan delights in war for it excite, excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another. Four mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth to the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the, by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. But they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. From this statement, I believe she believed like the pioneers, a literal war. Now, Brother Dustin, you can edit this part. I didn't bring my phone, and I want to share one quote that's on my phone. It's very important that I share it. Can you bring my phone, please? Because in light of all this, this is very important. 
We need to experience the Word of God. We need to experience the Word of God. Thank you. Notice what this statement says. Let those who know the truth arouse out of sleep and make every effort to reach the people where they are. We are to arouse out of what? Sleep. The work of the Lord must no longer be neglected by us and made secondary to worldly interests. Are we making secondary? It's probably even, not even second, right? To worldly interests. This is Col Cole Porter Evangelism 30, paragraph 2. What do you say? Do we need to rouse out of sleep? We have all these signs right before us. And there is, there, there is a reason why God has given us all this insight. And that is for you and I to awake. And start spending so much time in worldly interests. But prioritize and make God's work first. What do you say? I pray that this has helped to wake us up, to really, in prayer, take these things in, to God in prayer. Not only life is short, but time is short. We're running out of it. And we, we, um, we should... Work while it is day. For the night comes, we are told. We won't be able to work. So, with these words, uh, I'm going to invite you, if you can, one more time to please kneel with me. Dear Heavenly Father, prophetic truth is just another another um, act of your love because you allow us to see where we are and how close we are for your kingdom to come. And we thank you so much. I pray that we can arouse out of sleep as we read and that we can be about your business as Jesus was. And dear Father, please, we pray that you will give us his spirit as you have promised. That we can live out his life and not our own. I thank you and I ask that you be with us during this, uh, the rest of this Sabbath day. Please uh, be with our conversation. Help us to... Uh, stay, not to lose sight, that this is your holy day. Thank you, dear Father, and I pray that we can, again, we consecrate our lives to you as we see that that day approaches. We thank you for your love, and thank you for giving us Christ to die for our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name, your Son. Amen. <laughs> Standing on the Platform of Truth. Pioneer Health and Missions.